Give me a thumbs up when it's ready. Okay, I'm reading from 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Now this word committeth comes from a word which means who is always sinning and has no desire or will to stop. And the only way anybody can stop sinning is if Christ is in their life. We're in the first epistle of John, the third chapter, and verse 8. He that commits sin or doesn't stop sinning is of the devil. They're born of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning. In other words, the devil's never repented, and so his children never repent. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Okay, saying this is why the Son of God was revealed in flesh. Why? That he might do what? Destroy, say it, destroy, destroy. The, works the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy Satan's works in your life. Yes. Guilt and condemnation and evil and all those ugly things. He came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. He came to destroy the works of the devil. That includes sickness and disease. And we see Jesus, when he came into his ministry, he went about healing everybody who was sick. That's how we know it's God's will to heal everybody because Jesus came to show us God's will. And that's why we see everybody being healed, not just some. And so we know it's God's will for everybody to be healed. Say amen. Amen. Okay. Verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not go on sinning. Commit sin. Now... It has to mean does not go on sinning because everybody since they've been saved has committed a sin. And if committing a sin here or there means that you're not saved, then, then nobody's saved. <laughs> because everybody has sinned. And you'll find that out in the earlier parts of this epistle where John say, said, if any man says he has not sinned, then he is a liar. He's calling God a liar. But if we confess, we admit when we've sinned, then the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's what it means to dwell in the light when you're fessing up to everything, you're open about everything, you're not hiding anything in the dark. Okay, those who are in the dark are those who say they don't sin. Okay, whosoever is born of God does not go on sinning, for his seed is still in him. Amen? Amen? That word seed is the Greek word sperma. And we know that the seed of our parents contains the DNA or the nature of our parents, the human nature, but we've been born from above this time, and the seed is the Word of God, and the Word of God is incorruptible, it does not sin, and so anyone who is born of the seed, that seed remains in you once you're born, and that DNA remains into you, and even if you mess up, that seed will guide you to fess up to the truth, because it's the seed of truth, say it, the seed of truth. And it's your nature now to admit to the truth. And, Je and, the and Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, which are lies. Yes. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. He cannot go on sinning. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Whosoever covers up their sin, they're not doing righteousness. Whosoever lies about themselves and says that they, were, that they don't sin or have never sinned is lying. They, they're not born of the seed of righteousness and truth. Okay? And he says, And this the children of God are manifest. Whosoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Well, what is righteousness? Faith. Faith in the truth. Believing the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now go to chapter 4 and verse 4. You are of God. That means you've been born of God. You're of the divine nature, little children, and have overcome them. Yes. Why? Because greater, say greater, greater, is he that is in you than he that is in the world. How many believe that the God in you, the seed of God in you, is greater than anything out there in the world today? 
Amen. Amen. There's nothing outside of you that can conquer you because you have the conquering seed in you. Amen. <laughs> Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loves him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Amen. So, verse 4, look at verse 4 of chapter 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Say it. Whatsoever, whosoever is born of God conquers the world. The world does not overcome them, but they overcome it. The world does not conquer you, but you conquer it. What conquers it? Even your faith. Amen. Verse 5, who is he that conquers the world? But he who believes, say it, he who believes. Believe. Believes what? That Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. This is how you conquer the world. By believing the testimony of the Father who pointed to Jesus and said, He is my beloved Son. And when we believe the Father's testimony concerning His Son, that makes us more than conquerors. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a round of applause if you love him. He who believes, believes is the conquering victory. Believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Amen? Now, we're preaching on greater is he that is in you. Say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Okay, go to Joshua chapter 1. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless your word today. We thank you that you are the true Joshua. You are the true King of Kings. And we believe upon you unto everlasting life. Hallelujah. Thanking you that we shall never perish. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. There shall not any man, say it, any man, be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and of a good courage. All right, now let's look at this. In Joshua chapter 1, we see the continual reassurance that we can be strong and of a good courage. And what is that strength and courage based on? Not ourselves, but the knowledge that God is with us, that He is with us, He is around us, He is inside us, He's above us, He's underneath us, He's like a force field or an invisible shield against the enemy. Hallelujah! He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High remains under His his shadow, the shadow of the Almighty. In the Hebrew, it's the shadow of Shaddai. Amen. Hallelujah. So as long as Shaddai is with us and we can dwell in his shadow, the enemy cannot get us. The enemy cannot find us. The enemy cannot touch us. Hallelujah. A thousand will fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand, but it will not touch us. It will not come near us. No plague shall come near your dwelling because he gives his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Say it all your ways. That's on the job. That's in the kitchen. That's in the bedroom. That's in the living room. That's like driving down the highway. The Lord is with you. And as long as you keep that conscious knowledge of the fact that he will never leave you, he will never fail you, and he will never give up on you or forsake you because he is a conquering seed. Hallelujah. And you're born of the conquering seed. And that makes you a conquering seed. Jesus gave us the promise. He said, Lo, I am with you. Said he is with me. Always. In the morning, at noontime, in the evening, 
when I'm sleeping, the Lord is with me. Hallelujah, when my eyes are closed and when my eyes are open, when the devil comes in on the attack, the Lord is with me. The devil cannot harm me. The devil cannot touch me because the Lord is with me. The devil cannot kill me because the Lord is with me. And the Lord has the keys of hell and of death, not the devil. And so the devil doesn't call the shots over your life anymore. Jesus calls the shots. Hallelujah. And that's worth shouting about. How many believe the Lord will never fail you? Somebody said, well, he failed Peter because Peter denied him three times before his crucifixion. No, he didn't fail Peter. He told Peter, Satan has desired to have you and sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. And we know that the Father heareth his Son always. So therefore, Jesus never had an unanswered prayer in his life when he prayed to the Father about things that were in the will of God. And it was in the will of God that Peter be saved. Amen. And so nothing the devil could attack Peter with or and the devil no doubt poured the condemnation on Peter when Peter didn't have the courage to stand up for Jesus and didn't and denied him three times in the face of the unbelievers. No doubt he felt like a dog. But after Jesus' resurrection, he told the women, go tell Peter. Yeah. <laughs> He hadn't given up on Peter. Amen. He hadn't given up on Peter. He hasn't given up on you. Amen. If you're his sheep, then he's going to see you through Glory. every battle, every trial, every difficulty. Because he will not fail thee. Say it. He will not fail me. He will not fail me nor forsake me. And that's why I can be strong and have a good courage. Because I know the greatest one is with me. Caleb and Joshua saw the giant walls. And they saw the giants there. And they felt like grasshoppers in the sight of the giants. But you know what? Caleb and Joshua weren't looking at the giants. They were looking at a bigger giant. And his name was Jehovah. And next to Jehovah, the giants looked like grasshoppers. The gr giants looked like germs and bacteria. Why? Because they weren't looking at the obstacle. They were looking at the conqueror of all obstacles. Hallelujah. And Caleb and Joshua were the only ones that entered into the promised land. Why? Because they knew great. And they entered into the promised land and received their inheritance because they were believers. There's a difference between true believers and those who will not believe. It's the believers that are predestined to be saved. What do you mean? God looked down into time and from the very beginning determined everybody who believes on my son will be saved. But it's up to you or I to believe. Amen. And if we believe the words of God, then we are his true sheep. Amen. amen. God's true sheep are those who want the truth. Yes, amen. Those who desire truth. Those who are willing to accept the truth. First, we accept the truth that we're sinners and need a Savior. And so we get saved. Amen. Some people are not willing to admit that they need a Savior. And they think they can make it on to hev into heaven on their own good deeds, their own religious rituals, and all these other things. They're trying to work to, for salvation. They're bypassing the door. They're bypassing Christ. They're bypassing the cross because they think they don't need Jesus. They think they're good enough in themselves to make it without Him. But brother and sister, we who know the truth and have been set free know that there's nothing in us that can do it. We gave up a long time ago and we turned our life over to Jesus and said, here Lord Lord, here I am. You do it. I can't do it. When Jesus took over, he will not fail you and he will not abandon you. Be strong and have a good courage. How can I be strong and have a good courage? Just knowing that I have a God who's bigger than every enemy in my life and that he will never leave my side. So when I walk into a battle, I'm not walking into it alone, but I'm walking into it with a giant called Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he's not just with me, he's inside me. Say it, he's inside me. Greater is he who is in you, inside Inside you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. I've got Shaddai on my side. I've got the Almighty One on my side. Oh, glory to His name. Amen.
You know El Shaddai. He appeared to Abram and he said, I am God Almighty. In the Hebrew, it's, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be perfect. That walking before me means walk in my presence. Stay in my presence and be complete. Be whole. Have everything you need. Because the word Shaddai in the Hebrew comes from the Hebrew word Shad, which is breast. <laughs> Amen? And so, it is the breast of the woman that feeds her baby. What's in the woman comes through her breast and feeds the baby. And the baby even receives of the immune system of his mother or her mother by feeding from his mother's breast. Because what God designed to be in the breast, the very one that gave birth to the child is the very same one that feeds the child and nourishes the child so that it can become strong. Well, Jesus said, I am El Shaddai. I am God, your breast. You are my child. Feed on me. Stay in my bosom. Feed on me. And you will not only receive the nourishment that's in me, but you will receive my divine immune system that healeth the sick. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many know that Jesus is not sick today? Like that woman who found, they found, they found a lump in her breast. And she heard the message preached about, uh, as he is, so are we. How many of you believe we are as just as he is? Amen. He is our perfection. And so Jesus is our perfection. Amen. Not his own perfection, but our perfection. Amen. His healing is our healing. His health is our health. He doesn't have cancer, so we don't have cancer. And so this woman said, Lord... You don't have cancer, so neither do I. She went back to the doctor and the lump wasn't there anymore. Because she believed the Word of God. How many believe the Word of God today? And so the next time you start feeling shit, just say, Lord, you're not sick, so I'm not sick. I'm a member of your body. Now, if my whole body isn't sick, there's no such thing as my little finger being sick and then uh, my finger dies on my hand and the rest of my body is unaffected. And if you're connected to Jesus Christ, because he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, then what's in Christ is in you. The same Holy Ghost that is filling the Son of God at the right hand of the Father in glory today is the same Holy Spirit that's dwelling in you at the same time. And so the spirit that fills Christ's body is filling every one of us because we are his body. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're connected to him, and so we're connected to his divine health. And so we stay conscious of this and we live above natural circumstances. Yeah. Hallelujah. We live above disease and we live above sin and we live above all these things by virtue of the fact that we are members of the conquering seed at the right hand of the Father. And Paul said, when he died, you died. When he rose, you rose. When he ascended back to the Father, you ascended back together with him. And when he sat down, you sat down together with him. Him, everything that happened to his body is now true of you because you are now a member of that body. Amen. And so its history becomes your history. Christ's history becomes your history. He conquered death, so now that's your history. I conquered death. When? When I got saved in 1969? No. My history goes back 2,000 years ago when Jesus came out of that tomb. You and I came out with him because that's when his body came out. Now we're members of that body and so its history is now our history. Say Jesus' history is my history. His present condition is my present condition. He is whole, so I am whole. He is holy, so I am holy. He is set apart, so I'm set apart. He's the Son of God, so we're sons of God. He's healthy, so we're healthy. And that's why John prayed in his epistle and said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. Say it, be in health. Even as your soul prospers. Your body's supposed to follow suit with your soul. If Jesus redeemed your soul and saved your soul, then your body is supposed to prosper along with it because your soul, body, and spirit are so intertwined that what affects one affects the other. Hallelujah. And if your soul is saved and your soul is healthy and your soul is in health in Christ Jesus, then it affects your body and your body becomes healthy. Amen? Amen. That's how Jesus healed the sick, in anticipation of his body being broken on the cross. 
His body was broken on Calvary so that your body could be whole. Yes. Amen. Every wit hole. Say it, every wit hole. Yes. Everyone whole. And so when we're every wit whole, then that means mentally, spiritually, physically, hallelujah, <laughs> completely whole. Yes. That means we don't have to accept. Jesus doesn't have arthritis. Amen. Amen? Amen. And so let's not accept it. Here. Amen. And so we must renew our mind daily. Amen. Yes. How do we renew it? By Thank you, Jesus. seeing the promises of yes. God in His Word and confessing them. Say it, confess yes. them. Yes. And with the heart man believes, but with the mouth confession is made. Yes. So what you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. If you're confessing things with your mouth that are contrary to the Word of God, then you don't believe in your heart. You're not convinced in your heart. But you've got to be convinced in your heart. Now it's on your, it's to your benefit to believe what God says, not what the devil's telling you. Not what your body's telling you. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. So, well, didn't God give you eyes to see with? Yes, to see driving down the road, but not to see... Not to be blind to the invisible promises that God gave us that makes us more than conquerors. I mean, we don't see defeat, we see victory. We don't see everything working against us, we see everything working together for the good. Isn't that what it says in Romans chapter 8? Okay, so now how can I, how can I trust in a God that's this big? Okay, go to John chapter 10 and verse 22. John chapter 10. And the 22nd verse. Now Jesus is going to show here the difference between the children of devil, the devil and the children of God. Amen. Verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you already, and you didn't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. They testify of me. What did the works that Jesus did in his Father's name testify about him? He did good to people, and so that testified to the fact that he was good. He healed people, so that testified to the fact that he was out to better people's lives, not to ruin them, yes. not to destroy them, but to save their life, yes. to heal them, to get them out of the misery they were going through. He said, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. If you can't tell that the tree is good by looking at my fruit, then that's your problem. <laughs> When good fruit is being produced, you can count on one thing, it's coming from a good tree. If the fruit is diseased and poisonous, then it's not coming from a good tree. Now, if Jesus' works had been poisoned the man, then we could deduce from that that he wasn't good. But to call the fruit good but the tree evil was contrary to common logic. Yes. All right. And so Jesus answered them, I told you and you didn't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. They testify about what I am. But you don't believe because you're not of my sheep. Yes. Jesus' sheep believe on him. They know him. Yes. Amen? Yes. They know him. And that's why they believe on him. He said, my sheep hear my voice. Verse 27. And I know them, and they follow me. Who did, who did Jesus' sheep follow? Him. And I give unto them eternal life. I give them never-ending, everlasting, ever-enduring life. I give them in the present tense. What he gave us when we got saved, he's still giving us now. This eternal life. Hallelujah. That's why we're not perishing. That's why we're not going to hell. That's why we're not appointed under wrath. Because we are Jesus' sheep. And we will not follow the voice of a stranger. But we follow the good shepherd. Because we only know and recognize his voice. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. 
My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. If they perish, they weren't his sheep. Yes, come on. If people perish, it's because they're not really his sheep. Yes. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Mm -hmm. Why? Because my Father who gave them to me is greater than everyone else, and nobody is able, nothing is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Yes. Now notice it says, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. But that word man is in italics because it's not in the original Greek. Literally what it means is nothing shall be able to snatch them from my father. Why? Because my father is greater. How many believe that the father is greater? How many believe the son is greater than any enemy you have? And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and I'll love you and my father will love you and I will, we, we will come to you and make our abode with you. And when you love Jesus, you got saved. The father and the son came to make their abode in you through the Holy Spirit and they've never left you they've never forsaken you the same great mighty one that conquered your sin and conquered the devil out of your life is still abiding in you let him keep on conquering he will keep on conquering because he's dwelling in you and he's bigger than all your enemies yes, he's bigger than all your enemies yes. and that's why nobody will be able to pluck you out of his hand that's why nothing shall be able to pluck you out of his hand. Now, now, why do I go one step further and not just say people won't be able to pluck you out, but no circumstance will ever be able to pluck you out. Go to Romans chapter 8. And I want to close with Romans chapter 8 today. Because the giant God in your life who's bigger than every enemy is love. Say it, God is love. It is his mighty love that keeps you. It is his mighty love that preserves you. Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. Let's begin reading in verse 28. We know that all things, all circumstances, all situations work together for good. Work together for what? Yes. So that's, going, that's on our side, right? Yes. All circumstances are working for us good. Even though they sometimes appear to be evil, they're doing something good for us. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Who is a God foreknew? Believers. Yes. Believers. He didn't predestinate you to believe, but he predestinated that everybody who did willingly believe would be his children. Yes. Okay, let's keep it straight. Moreover, verse 30, whom he did predestinate them, he also called, and whom he called them, he also justified, and whom he justified... Some of them, only some of them were glorified. No, 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 no. If he called you and justified you, then he intends to glorify you. Amen. Notice these words are in the past tense in the English. Called, justified, glorified. It's already a done deal. You're already as good as, as glorified. And that's why John said, we know that when he appears, we're going to be exactly like him. Not just in our soul and spirit, but our body's going to be changed. Okay, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? What shall we say to the fact that we know all our circumstances are working together for our good? And what shall we say to the fact that this God who called us, called us for a reason because he intended to justify us and he intended to ultimately glorify us and he can get the job done. Yeah. Amen. Because he'll never leave us or forsake us. He'll never give up on us. He'll never fail us. Verse 31, what, what should we then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Yes, amen. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for all of us, how shall he not, say it, how shall he not, with him, with Jesus, also freely, liberally, give us all things. If 
he didn't hold back his own son, what will he hold back? Yes. Nothing. nothing. Say it, nothing. nothing. God will not hold any good thing back from his children. Amen. And he proved it when he gave his son. Because when he gave his son, he gave the best he had. Mm -hmm. Which shows us one thing, that God is willing to give us his best. Yes. Amen. 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 We do not need to settle for the worst because God is out to give us his best. So let's believe him for the best. Amen. 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 He gave us the best when he gave us Jesus. And so he, God is trying to tell everybody, can't you see there isn't anything I won't give? Can't you see there's nothing I'll hold back from you? When I gave Jesus, I showed you I was willing to give the best that I had. So how will he not freely give us everything else he has? This is Paul's logic here. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. It's not God who will charge you. It's not God who will condemn you. God isn't out to condemn you. God is out to justify all those whom he has called them. He also what? Justify. <laughs> He'll make a way for you to emerge even from your failures, and make you a victor. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's not God, because it's God who's justifying you. Who is he that condemns? There's all kinds of people that will condemn Christians. Preachers get behind pulpits and condemn the congregation. They condemn people in the congregation. They humiliate people in front of others. That is not God's will. The Bible says, let all things be done to edifying. Say it, edifying. Not deadifying, edifying. Okay. So, he says, who is he that condemns? It isn't Christ. It's Christ who died, yes, rather, who is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who is also condemning us? No, who's interceding for us, who's standing before the Father. He's standing before the Father and saying, yes, Father, my, my brother, my sister failed, but I died to make up for their failure. And so I claim forgiveness for them so they can keep on standing. Jesus is out making your case. Yes, you. Say, Jesus is making my case. He's a great defense lawyer. He's defending me, not condemning me. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God. Who also is making intercession for us, verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now here it is. We are joined to the love of Christ. And that's why the Father is justifying us. And that's why the Son is praying for us 24-7. Say it 24-7. When I'm asleep, Jesus is praying for me. Okay. So then, who can separate us from his love? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution? No. Now notice, these are things, these are not people. Yes. Famine, no. nakedness, no. peril, no. sword. No. Verse 37, nay, no, in all these things, say it, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him who loves us. Hallelujah. Verse 38. Now here it goes. Nothing can separate us. Nothing can pull us out of his hand or his father's hand because they're greater. Verse 38. For I am persuaded. Are you persuaded? There's a lot of Christians out there today that are not persuaded that God's able to keep them. They're, they're concerned that they may fall. They may lose out with God. All these other nonsensical things. Okay. I am persuaded that neither death nor if I keep on living. I'm not going to fall out of his hand. If I live a hundred years, he's going to keep me that next hundred years. I'm convinced. I believe. Amen. Hallelujah. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present. Say it, things present. Things present. Nothing can separate, separate me today from Christ's love. Amen. Say it, nothing can separate me can today, separate today, today from Christ's love. From Christ's love. <laughs> Nor things present, nor things to come. 
I just put on my Facebook recently, there's nothing waiting for you down the road around the corner yes. that's going to defeat you. Yes. Because God's already made provision for it. He knows what's waiting for you around the corner. He knows what's waiting for you tomorrow. And so therefore, Jesus told his, the listeners, don't be worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. He said there's enough evil to stand against today. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Well, the devil comes up and he says, well, what if this happens? And what if this falls through? And, and what if you don't have a money, enough money to do this? You're going to end up out on the street. Shut up, devil! Hallelujah! <laughs> yes. If I did end up in the street, Jesus would be there in the street with me. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Nor things to come. Somebody said, well, what if a month from now you quit serving God? How am I going to quit serving God a month from now? We're not even supposed to worry about tomorrow, let alone a month from now. Right. Hello? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> well, you failed before. Yeah, and look, you're right back here again. Jesus pulled you out and brought you back home. Because he's on your side. He didn't leave you. He didn't leave you when you're away from God. You weren't really away from God after all. You only thought you were. David said, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. <laughs> if I take the wings of the morning and fly to the othermost part of the sea or the othermost part of the earth, I meet you over there. Yes. Wherever I go, I meet you. You know why? Not because David was following God, but because God was following David all around. Amen. Hallelujah. Nor height, nor depth, no matter how high you get or no matter how deep you may sink, Amen. it's not going to separate you from His love. Amen. Nor any other creature, no other created thing in this universe shall be able to separate us. You know why? Because He said, I'll never leave you. So how can anybody separate us if Jesus isn't going to walk away? shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Because greater is he who is love. God is love. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yes, Amen? It's his almighty love that's keeping you. And that's what casts out all fear. Yes. Knowing that he loves you supremely, perfectly enough to keep you and never leave you all the days of your life. And he said, I give you eternal life and you will never perish. He didn't say you might. He didn't say I give you probationary life. And he said, well, what about false prophets? God's true sheep will not follow a false prophet because they know not the voice of strangers and they will not follow them. They may be detoured for a moment, but they'll always come back. Amen. Now listen, I want to share with you the account of a shepherd who grew up under a shepherd father in the Middle East, Lebanon. And he said that he saw someone one time, or he, maybe it was him. The shepherd has what's called a shepherd's coat that he wears over his shoulders. And one day, the sheep were resting in the, in the meadow, or whatever the area was. And he thought he'd try to fool the sheep by putting on the shepherd coat, whoever this was. And the sheep got up because they saw this figure standing with a shepherd's coat on. And they started to get up and to follow him. And he called out the words that his father would use to get the sheep to follow him. Te'a, te'a, ho, ho, ho. And when he did, the sheep stopped and wouldn't follow him. He had the right look. Yes. But it was the wrong voice. They did not know that boy's voice, but they knew only the voice of the shepherd. And you know what? We may be fooled here or there.
here by someone, but ultimately, if we listen long enough, we'll say, hey, wait a minute, that's not the word of God they're preaching. That's not the truth. That's not the Bible. I don't have to worry and fear that I'm going to fall out of grace or that I'm going to be lost because my Jesus, I only hear his voice. I read his word, and as long as I stay in his word, I know that nothing can fool me. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet and lift your hands and glory in the Lord today. Glory in the Lord. Glory in the Lord. Because greater is he. Greater is he. And he said, I'll not fail you. I'll not forsake you. He won't fail you. He's working on your will every day, both to will and to do what's pleasing to him. So how in the world, if he's affecting your will and he's molding your will, you gave up your own free, selfish will when you made Jesus Lord of your life. Hallelujah. And so when you will to do things, it's generally the Lord in you that's causing you to want to do that. What are you saying? He won't will you to do sin or to do evil to your brother or to your sister or to your neighbor, but he will always will good things in your life. Hallelujah. And that's how you know that you can go on and you can be saved and you can serve the Lord because it's God who is greater than your will. And so how can your will conquer his will when he's working on your will to conform to his will? Amen. Amen. I don't have to be afraid because I know how big the God is that's with me. I don't have to fear any circumstance because I know that the mighty God who is not only with me is love. And love is looking out for my benefit and my welfare. And love ain't going to do me no dirty thing. Love is going to only preserve me and bring me out and make me exactly as he is. He's more than a conqueror and as he is, so am I. Because Jesus is conqueror, I'm conqueror. Because he's a son of God, I'm a son of God. Because he's elect. I'm elect. Because he's chosen, I'm chosen. Because he's beloved, I'm beloved. And that's why Paul said, we are accepted in the beloved. We are beloved even as he is loved of the Father. The Father loves you just as much as he loves his own son. How can you be sure? Because he is willing to let his own son die for your sins so you could go free. Doesn't that tell you something? God was willing to turn his back on his own son so that he could have us. That's a, pretty high, that's a pretty big statement. But it's a big statement because it's a big truth and a big reality from a big God. Mm -hmm. So don't let fear come into your life. Fear only comes in when you think maybe God won't see you through. Fear only comes in when you think maybe God won't provide the need. Fear only comes in when you start worrying that maybe God isn't a keeper of his promises. But when you keep your eyes on Jesus, Hey, Peter, the waves can't suck you under. As long as Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he was walking on top of the waves. Amen? Yes. He was walking on the storm because he had his eyes fixed on the greater one, the Lord Jesus. And even when Peter took his eyes off him, Jesus reached out and snatched him back up again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And what he did for Peter, he'll do for us. Yes. Because believe it or not, sometimes we take our eyes off him. Yes. And we start looking at the problem instead of the problem solver. Yes. We start looking at the difficulty instead of the one who erases difficulties. Hallelujah. Now can he really do it? Can we trust him? Yes. If he lay in a tomb dead for three days and still managed to come out, then I'll, very, I'll guarantee you there's nothing too hard that he can't overcome. Amen. He's already proven himself. Amen? Mm -hmm. Let's find a place to pray and praise the Lord and just thank Him and focus on His love and His care for us and that bigger is the God in us than the problems in our world. I like what one person said. They said, don't tell God about your mountain. Tell your mountain about your God. Tell your difficulty that your God is bigger than that difficulty. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.